So, um, like I said, we will post this uh, recording from today's uh, Lunch and Learn on our website, same location where you registered. Um, also, all the materials that uh, we use today, we will post on our website as well. And I will put that link in the chat. There we go. One more person joining us. Um, meeting in the chat. There we go. All right. So we will post um, the uh, slide deck that we used today under the FAFSA resources here. Um, so thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. My name is Twyla. I'm the Director of Outreach at the Department of Higher Ed. Um, and I am overseeing uh, the FAFSA and CASFA completion as well as um, the foster care student um, navigators in our office, which I think that I saw a few of them on here. So hello. Um, Thank you all for joining us today. I am going to, my notes of course, just went by the wayside again. They keep on disappearing. I don't know if anybody else is having Teams issues today, um, but I am going to get this. Um, okay. Sorry for the delay here. I'm just gonna open this again. I don't know why my meeting minutes keep on disappearing. Um, anyways, let's just go ahead and jump right in. Um, today we have questions um, that we are going to curate um, as well as uh, we are going to ask certain or answer the questions that we had at the beginning when we first, when you registered for today's event. But for, to, um, for today's purposes, so we can kind of keep them organized, I am going to put this link in here, if you could put your question in here, and then at the end, we will go through these if they have not been, um, if they have not been answered. Uh, so let me get this link, click share, there we go. Copy. There is the link. So please put any questions that you may have in there and we will um, answer those as we go along. I will pass it over to Martha and then Sophie so they can introduce themselves and then we will get started uh, with our presentation. Thank you. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is Martha um, Herrera and I'm in, I am the FASFA coordinator. Hello, thank you again for joining us. My name is Sophie Vogel and I am the CASFA coordinator. And Martha and I have a PowerPoint presentation that we're going to show you at this time. We're just going to sort of um, jump back and forth. She's going to start, I'll continue. And then of course, um, if you have any questions about our presentation, please put them in the form and we'll address them at the end. Awesome, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Oh my gosh, I lost it. Um, Sophie, do you mind sharing uh, the presentation? Of course, be happy to. How's that look? Everyone able to see it? Okay, awesome. So um, this is our presentation, the 2024-25 FASFA CASFA changes. So if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so we're going to talk about why are all these changes happening? Um, so it is because of the FASFA Simplification Act. It was ratified in August of 2022 with the intent to streamline the application. It should have less questions and hopefully make it a less daunting process to fill out. The main goal for this legislation is to make it more user-friendly, span eligibility for federal aid, and reduce barriers for, for certain student populations. 
All right, so timeline changes. So we finally have a day. Um, FASFA is going to be launching December 31st. So if you or any of your students don't have anything to do on New Year's Eve, um, y'all can check out the FASFA. Um, but yeah, it's finally, we finally have a day. It will open on December 31st. Um, so students and families will be able to complete and submit the FASFA form by December 31st. Students will not be able to make any corrections on the form until the end of January. Um, colleges and universities will not receive ICERs until the end of January as well. So even though they'll be able to um, submit the form, they won't be able to make any corrections. So what can um, we all do now is support students and contribute a contributors in creating FSA ID. So we are encouraging students and, contrib and contributors to um, create their FSA IDs now um, so they can be prepared. Um, and then once it launches on December 31st, they can just hit the ball running. Um, also plan ahead for FAFSA, CASFA completion night. Plan other events, communicate with staff members, students, and families about these um, important updates coming up. Um, and also think tra train training the trainer and FAFSA, CASFA completion as separate tasks. Ask for help from your local institutions, higher education, CDHE. So um, if you host like uh, FAFSA nights and if we're able to attend, um, y'all can um, submit a form and um, we can see if we can um, attend those events with you all. And I am going to pass it over to Sophie to talk about um, CASFA or FAFSA, which are students eligible for. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, so great that we finally have some information from the uh, Department of Education. Um, I realize I may not have added this to our presentation, so I'm just going to say it right now. Um, CASFA is launching when FAFSA launches. So since we know FAFSA is launching December 31st, 2023, CASFA is also launching then as well. So um, for anyone who wants to, this is a great resource um, and we'll continue to distribute this. Um, this is the updated version um, of helping students and families figure out which are you eligible for FAFSA or CASFA. I'm going to start with FAFSA first because FAFSA is um, a federal document. And so um, a U.S. citizen will complete a FAFSA. In addition, an eligible non-citizen um, will complete a FAFSA. Um, an eligible non-citizen will be eligible either because they're a U.S. permanent resident, they have an I-94 document that indicates um, one of those following five, um, uh, maybe it's considered statuses, um, and then potentially having a T visa or um, qualifying under VAWA. Um, all of that information comes directly from FAFSA's website. So if you have any questions about who's eligible for FAFSA, don't ask us, check their website because that's actually not our document. What we do know about is CASFA. I specifically, since I'm the CASFA coordinator, can help understand who is eligible for CASFA. So if you look on the left-hand side, um, you will see that the CASFA is for students who are not U.S. citizens. On, within that, um, there's a few um, specifications. If students qualify as Colorado asset students, that's terrific for them. Um, specifically, those two bullets uh, below the Colorado asset are the definition of Colorado asset. And so if students um, have attended a Colorado high school for at least one year prior to graduation or been physically present, um, in Colorado for at least one year before their GED and have continuous and physical presence in Colorado for 12 months before the start of the semester, um, they may be asset eligible. Um, and that means that through CASFA, if they complete a CASFA and they're income eligible and they are a Colorado asset student, they may receive the Colorado um, student grant. So that is a wonderful benefit of the CASFA. Additionally, please note the, the final bullet. Um, for students who are not Colorado asset students, if they don't have a high school diploma or a GED from Colorado, if they don't meet that red residency, um, but they have financial need, please recommend that they complete a CASFA. A CASFA is the best way for a college or university to get um, an understanding of their financial situation and if they have financial need, even if a student isn't eligible for the Colorado student grant, they may be eligible for institutional aid. So that is some information about that. 
Um, so I just want to talk about the cast of form. I'm going to share it right now. I have access to beta test the form. And luckily I got access on Monday afternoon. So it's pretty new. I wouldn't say I'm an expert on the new form yet. Um, I want to make sure you all know what I'm going to show you right now is not finalized and is subject to change. So thank you for your understanding about, and please be flexible. Um, and so, we, I may have more updates um, December 13th, so I look forward to sharing that with you next time. So let me see if I can pull up here. So what I normally do when I go to CASFA is I actually just Google something like CASFA. Of course, my Google knows me, so maybe pulls up easier, but um, that's one way to find it. And then click here. I'm just going to do essentially a CASFA walkthrough for a few minutes um, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, this is the CASFA website. If you scroll down, it says to apply for CASFA, apply here. Um, we also have translated the same information here. So I'm just going to click here. Obviously, the link is the same. We'll take you to this um, portal. What um, all of the new students need to do is they need to create an account. Don't have an account, sign up. So click that, and then it takes you to registration el eligibility. We have this information in English and Spanish. Please make sure you understand this. The CASFA applicants um, should only, or Colorado State financial aid applicants should only complete one financial aid application, FAFSA or CASFA per, per award year. Um, so are you a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen as described above? The student needs to say no. If they say yes, it'll tell them you need to complete a FAFSA. So you say, no, I am not a citizen. And then go ahead. I have some uh, test emails set up because that's my job to test them. So um, the student is going to put in a personal email here. Please recommend that students not use school emails. There, of course, is a um, password process, right? Where you have to follow all these rules in order to, um, have your password work. Um, I did because I do this a lot. Um, so then I go continue and it says, please validate your email. So I'm going to open that email account, which is right here. Um, and as you can tell, I, um, I email with CASFA a lot. So when you open the email, um, it says, follow this link to verify your email address. So the first step is complete. We have verified um, the email address. So now I can go to continue. I'm actually going to go back here. So the email, I think many of you have done this many times, I would assume, um, in terms of verifying an email. So all we've done right now is verify an email. So the next step, oops, I apologize, I typed my password incorrectly, is going to be student account validation. So um, uh, please make sure that um, you check, I guess, at the top of the screen to make sure that the information looks correct. So we are creating a financial aid account. So I'm gonna call this student Ray and I'm gonna call them Martine. Um, this student is not going to have a social security number, so I'm going to leave it blank, and I'm going to have them born um, January 1st, 2005. Again, I do this a bit, so I have some practice going through this form. I'm trying to be um, efficient with your time while also um, effective. So let's see. I just created this portal. Um, please note these are useful links. We're actually going to talk about them at the end, but you can go here and um, help your students see we have a bunch of potentially useful links. We are also in the process of continuing to upgrade um, and update these links. Um, I am surprised to see this. I wonder, um, I feel like I need to go somewhere else because the new account that I created doesn't have um, the new application. So that must be because the configuration isn't right. So let me see if I can go to an old account so I can show you the, the right configuration. So sorry about that. Um, I have been, as you all know, working on this um, and not had 
The user may have been deleted. Let's see if we can try that again. Test 19. I feel like when I tested that student, that was the one who I successfully created a. Um, give me a second, everyone. I think we're going to move on with the presentation and then hopefully come back to my CASFA live demonstration. Um, this probably um, feels like your experience with CASFA, that there are some challenges. So I'm going to try to resolve my challenges. And I just really want to thank you for working through uh, and working with CASFA as we um, figure it out. So I'm going to, let's see, go back to the presentation. Um, and again, thanks for um, your patience as we um, proceed. So, Martha, do you want to go for it? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Sophie. Um, thanks, everyone, for being patient with us. Um, so I'm going to share some um, an overview of the changes with the FASFA. Um, so the FASFA and CASFA are similar and follow the, the same completion guidelines, but forms will look, will look different. Uh oh, I think you skipped a slide. There you go. Thank you. Um, all right. So there's new terminology with the CASFA and FASFA. Um, some new terminology is um, the word contri contributors. Um, so it's it is a new term being introduced on the 2024-2025 FASFA. It refers to anyone who is required to provide information on a student's form, such as parent, step parent, or spouse. A, um, FASFA will determine which contributor, if any, will be required to provide information on the form. And then we also have the um, federal tax information. It, re it replaces the data retrieval tool. Um, previously, users had the option to enter their tax information manually um, or use the IRS data retrieval tool. With the better FAFSA, everyone must provide consent for the Department of Education to receive tax information or confirmation of non-filing status directly from the IRS. In a very small, a small number of cases, students and families will have to enter their tax, um, tax information manually, uh, but for the most part, it will automatically transfer into the application. This change makes it easier to complete the form um, and reduces the number of questions as well. And then uh, family size, uh, it replaces the term household size. On the FAFSA form, it captures the appropriate number um, of family members and dependents in the applicant's household. Um, and then parent, it goes to biological, legally adopt adoptive um, step parent if parent remarry. Um, and then consent, um, it is required for um, everyone. Um, it is required for all contributors to give um, permission to retrieve and disclose federal tax information directly from the IRS. If they do not provide consent, the student will be ineligible to receive um, financial aid. So it is very important for contributors to provide consent. Um, and then another uh, major change is the FASFA's new student aid index. This replaces the EFC. Um, the, it does replace the EFC metric to calculate aid eligibility. The SAI represents an amount that estimates what families can pay for a student's education cost, and it considers factors like household income and assets. The student's eligibility for need-based um, financial aid is determined by subtracting the SAI and other financial assistance form from the cost of uh, attendance. Um, so the equation is cost of attendance minus SAI minus other financial assistance, it equals financial need. And I will talk a little bit more about um, the SAI in um, future slides. All righty. And then the FAFSA submission summary, this replaces the student aid reports, which used to be the SAR. Um, so this document provides a summary of the data input on the FAFSA form. Students will, will not receive their uh, FAFSA submission summary until the end um, of January. They will receive um, their 
SAI and their PEL uh, eligibility, but they will not receive the FAFSA submission summary until the end of January. Um, so if students are concerned, why are they not receiving it? They will receive it until the end of January. Um, and then another one is the other financial aid um, used to as used to be estimated financial aid. Now it will be other financial aid. And then our authentication backup code replaces the safe key. Alrighty, so new student aid index. It is used to measure a family financial strength to determine financial student aid eligibility. Um, so like I said, the equation is cost of attendance minus SAI minus other financial aid equals the need. The SAI no longer used to assume or estimate what students or family can pay or cont contribute towards their educational costs. Um, so the SAI can help students receive more financial aid while the minimum EFC was zero. The SAI can go as low as negative 1,500, allowing students to show a higher financial need. Another new update is that the number of students in college will not be taken into consideration when calculating the SAI. Uh-oh, I think, I think we skipped a slide, Sophie. There you go, thank you. An SAI of negative 1500 allows for automatic, automatic Pell Grant eligibility up to the maximum Pell Grant award and at the same level as the zero SAI. This includes non-tax filers. Um, maximum and minimum Pell Grant will be based on family size, income, tax filing status, and or poverty level guidelines. Um, income will automatically transfer to a FAFSA with consent. So I know I've said this in past slides, but it is very important for the um, contributor to uh, provide consent. Alrighty, some other changes that will be effective in the award year. The FAFSA Simplification Act has removed questions about selective service registration and uh, selective service registration and drug related convictions. Um, it added questions about applicants, sex, race, and ethnicity. Um, and also students have the option of of putting prefer not to answer, but that's that question is going to be available. Um, given incarcerated students in federal and state correctional facilities, the ability to receive a federal Pell Grant, um, they must be enrolled in a prison education program though. Alrighty, so another new, um, uh, New change is the FSA ID and consent. It is required for all contributors contributors to create an FSA ID. It will be their electronic signature and consent. Each contributor with a social security number must create their own FSA ID and issue their name as it appears on their social security card, social security number, date of birth, and email. Students should use a personal email, not their high school one, because once they graduate, the school one will discontinue. Um, so it's very important for them to create their own. And then contributors must have their own email and not use the student's email. Contributors without a social security number will be able to create an FSA ID as well. And I will talk a little bit more about the details on my next slide. And then require all contributors to provide consent. If no consent is provided, students will be ineligible for federal student aid. All right. So parents who are contributors without a social security number must create an FSA ID. It will be available when the FAFSA launches in December. So this new feature is not going to be available until December 31st. Um, so the majority of FSA ID creation process will be similar to those with um, social security numbers. Users without a social security will have the option to answer knowledge-based questions to be able to verify their identity. Um, so FSA ID will use TransUnion, uh, TransUnion services to ask knowledge-based questions to help with identity verification. Examples of these questions may include current or former address, a previous phone number, um, answers will be multiple choice, um, and then also parents will not need an IT to set up an FSA ID number. Um, so once they log in to create their FSA ID is going to have an option that says, uh, I do not have a social security number, and then they will just click that option and they do not need to put zeros or nines anymore. 
If a person is not able to successfully answer the online questions, they will receive an email through a process that will require to submit documents manually. Um, for, exa for example, the documents can be a state ID, foreign passports, um, but none of these um, um, documents can be expired. They have to be up to date. Um, if both processes don't work, then the student and parent will need to complete the uh, paper version. Alrighty, and more changes with the FAFSA Simplification app will ask 36 questions instead of 108. So hopefully it's a less daunting process and user-friendly for um, parents and students. So it's gonna be shorter. Um, it can take from 10 minutes to an hour. It totally depends on the situation, but hopefully it's a more streamlined process. Um, it offers an, electro an electronic and paper application as well. With the electronic application, students can um, choose up to 20 schools. And with the paper application, only 10 schools are allowed to be added. It's also removing the housing status question. And it is asking students if they are pursuing an initial K through 12 teaching certification. That's an added question. Um, and another question that's going to be added is it is going to ask if a student, if students, if a parent was killed in the line of duty as well. Okay, so also um, ask for number of students in college. Um, so this, it'll still ask the question, but it will no longer be included in the uh, SAI um, calculation. It will also remove the work study question. Um, it is going to determine family size by the number of exemptions claimed on the federal tax return. Um, it is going to be a question added on the FAFSA. If family size differs, student can appeal this with their fin financial aid office. Um, also, it's going to ask fewer questions around ho homeless eligibility. Um, so students um, will have automatic renewal without verification if they remain in the same college. They will not need to do this process again if they remain in the same college um, after their first year. And then McKinney Vento Farm is the only required document from high schools or agencies. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, Oh. <laughs> require um, dependent students to invite their contributors to complete the FAFSA form. Alrighty. Um, and then require asset questions. Um, so net value of businesses and forms of any size will be counted uh, as assets. Um, this is new on the form. Um, also current available amounts in cash, checking and savings, um, child support payment received, payments towards tax deferred pensions reported on federal, federal tax return will be considered as well. Alrighty, and then we also have a FAFSA prototype that it's now available. Um, so if, um, let me, I'm going to try to share my screen if I can share it with you all um, to show you what the prototype looks like. So give me a second. So this is a great tool for um, you all to kind of play around um, and play different scenarios to see um, what it's going to look like. Is everyone able to see my screen? Yeah, okay, awesome. So you just go to the website and then you click uh, prototype and then enter the access code, which is prototype 2425. And you click on it and then you can see that there's different um, scenarios that you can choose from. Um, so I am going to choose um, Raya. So I'm going to put launch this user um, and then it's going to take me to this page. So this uh, so Raya already created her FSA ID and password. So we're just going to click login um, and then it's going to bring me to this page and it's going to and we're going to choose the 24 25 FAFSA form and we're going to click start new form. Um, and then it's going to bring Raya to this page asking if Raya is a student or parent. Um, because now um, it's going to be divided. So the student's only going to fill out their portion and then send an invitation, um, send an email um, to invite the parents so they can fill out their portion. 
So we're going to click student and then continue. And then it's going to take us to this overview um, page of like what the FAFSA is. And then we're going to click continue. And then right here is going is where it's going to explain who is a contributor and how to invite them. So contributors will need to log in with their own FSA ID to provide their information. To invite a contributor to your FAFSA form, you'll need to provide their name, date of birth, social security number, and email address. So it is very important for students to have the correct information or else the parents will not receive this invitation. And the invitation will only be good for 45 days. So after 45 days, if the um, parent hasn't filled out their uh, portion, the student has to go back in and resend the invitation. And then continue. So what to expect? Every contributor must provide consent and approval uh, for you to be eligible for federal student aid. Um, so like I said this so many times, it's so important for the contributors to provide this consent. Um, and then after submitting the FAFSA forms, what's going to happen? So after January 2024, um, the form will be processed within three days. Um, so I'll, the, till the end of January, um, the student will receive their FAFSA submission summary. It, it will include the student aid index, the SAI, a number used to determine federal student aid, and then schools will be able to use their SAI to create their financial aid to offer um, to offer them um, what they will be getting. But like I said, this will be until the end of January because students will not receive ICERs until the end of January. So then we're going to click start the FAFSA form. And then right here, it's just going to show um, if Raya's information is correct. Hopefully, yep, everything's right. So then we're going to put continue. And then um, so the date the student became a legal resident. Um, so let's say since Raya was born, so 0A 2006. Um, and then we're going to put continue. And then right here is where I know a lot of students are probably going to skip this, uh, but this will explain what um, what they need, if they will, if they're willing to provide consent. Um, so I know it's long, but it is very important for students to click approve. If they click deny, uh, decline, um, it will let them know that they won't be eligible for financial aid and that they will only be um for um, loans. So then we'll again put provide consent. Uh, and then more information. Uh, so, so then we're gonna put continue. And then this is going to ask about their, um, if they, their personal current marital status. So then Raya is single, never married. And then we're going to put continue. And then when the student begins the 2024-25 school year, um, will the student be a first year freshman? So for this case, Raya will be a first year freshman um, and she will not have a bachelor's degree when she starts on the year of 2024-2025. Then we put continue. And then these are if the student has personal circumstances. Right now, later on our slide, we're going to talk about like um, personal circumstances um, versus uh, the special ones. So we'll talk about that later in our presentation. Um, but right here is asking this, if the student's currently serving on active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces for purposes other than training, if the student's a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces. So we're going to go through all of them, um, but none of these apply to Raya. So we're just going to put none of these apply. And then, up. Okay, awesome. So these are kind of like how it's going to look, but I'm going to stop here because I want to be able to have time for questions. And also if uh, Sophie was able to um, pull up the CASFA um, updates as well, um, but you can totally just go to um, the a prototype and then click different scenarios. This is a great tool for you all to um, practice and play different scenarios right now before it opens. So that way when um, you're working with the student, you're familiar with the questions that are going to be asked. And then I'm going to stop sharing. And then if you could please just share the presentation, Sophie, so I can just talk about the last slide. Thank you. Um, so the last slide is the paper FAFSA will still be available um, 
and here is the link to it. So the paper FAFSA is available for users for users who are having issues creating an FSA ID, users whose contributors are having issues creating an FSA ID, so incarcerated individuals with limited access to the internet. Um, the processing time will be slower with the paper FAFSA, but students are welcome to still submit it. Um, and then the paper FAFSA with wet signatures will still require identity confirmation process. Um, we don't know the process yet. It's to be the determined, but this option will still be available. Amazing. Uh, Martha, thank you so much. Um, at this time, I was not able to fix my configuration. I'll see if I can pull something up at the end, or maybe you all should come back December 13th. Um, and thank you for your patience. Um, like I said, I, I have seen the 2425 CASFA form. It does exist. Um, and I did complete one in testing. Um, I was hoping to do that with you today. But um, like I said, unfortunately, when um, I created that account, the account showed um, the 2324 CASFA, which I didn't want to review with you all. So bear with us as we um, complete our presentation. Um, I wanted to talk about financial aid circumstances. So unusual circumstances is the language that the Department of Education is using with dependency status. So that is going to be different than special circumstances and appeals that are happening at financial aid offices at colleges and universities. So... Um, unusual circumstances are when a student is unable to provide parent information due to unusual circumstances. So some of them are going to be human trafficking, um, legally granted refugee or asylum status, parent, parental abandonment or estrangement, or student or parental incarceration. Um, if you have other questions about what constitutes unusual circumstances, um, you're, I feel like Googling it, you there's some pretty good resources online and we also have support on our website. So unusual circumstances are going to be things that are sort of addressed on the FAFSA itself versus special circumstances. Special circumstances are going to be addressed at the financial aid office where the student is hoping to attend. Um, so special circumstances are when the student or contributor experiences significant changes to their financial situation, such as loss of employment or financial access, reduction in income, tuition expenses at um, a school, or unusual medical or dental expenses not covered by insurance. So um, the if a student has unusual circumstances, mm, that might be my next slide, um, they will potentially be granted provisional independent student status. So this is a change on the 24-25 FAFSA. Um, so students who put on their FAFSA that they have some of those unusual circumstances um, will be able to complete the FAFSA without providing parental information, and that is new. And then um, provisionally independent students will receive an estimate of their financial student aid eligibility, and students may need to provide additional documentation. The financial aid administrators at the colleges and universities will make the final determination of a student's circumstances based on the documentation. And if a school approves a student's unusual circumstances, their independent status will remain if they stay at the same school and their circumstances don't change. So then the other one, because um, I don't have a slide about it, about special circumstances, I want to make sure you all are aware. Special circumstances, like if a student and family brings in their 2022 taxes and they say, oh, we lost our jobs, we're not making this kind of money anywhere near this, um, that's going to be something where they um, complete a professional judgment at their college or university with the financial aid office. And they're going to talk about their special circumstances there through the professional judgment. Um, so um, we actually have made it to about the end of our presentation. Um, here are some resources. Um, this will be available to you. This presentation is going to be available to you on our website. So you can um, check them out there. They're pretty um, beneficial. Um Martha, did you want to say anything about the last one, the last resource that we added this week? Um, yes, of course. That's just like a checklist that um they can use um to provide for families as well. Awesome. Thank you. And then um here are the useful links that I started to show you all when um the CASPA application was open and looking like it would show us the 
24, 25 uh, form. So more um, resources, this is available um, when you have a CASFA account. If you're working with students, please recommend that they use the useful links. And then um, to contact me, here's my email and phone. Um, to contact Martha, here is her email and phone. Here is the link for December 13th. Um, again, uh, we look forward to maybe seeing you next time. And thank you for your patience as I um, learn how to give access to the um, the beta testing of the CASFA form. Um, at this point, we're going to move into the next section of our um, Lunch and Learn series, which is um, our uh, question and answer section. So um, you all submitted some questions to us. Thank you for doing that when you registered. And right now we're going to review those questions and the answers to those questions. And then after that, we'll get to the questions that you shared with us using the form in the chat. And I just fixed the form. So you should be able to input your question now. Okay. I will um, review the questions that you all submitted when you registered. Um, so one of the questions that was asked is how will SAI be calculated? Um, so the SAI is determined by family size, federal tax information, and assets reported on the FAFSA. The number in college does not impact SAI, and the SAI can be as low as negative 1,500. The SAI can help students receive more financial aid. While the minimum EFC was zero, the SAI can go as low as negative um, 1,500, allowing students to show a higher financial need. Another question was, um, so I need a, a full overview of what changes have been made and when does it roll out and how are students who have dual household split parenting impacted by this? So the FAFSA will roll out uh, uh, December 31st. Woo -hoo. Um, second question, when parents are divorced, separated, or never married and do not live together, only one parent must complete the FAFSA. This will be the parent who provides more financial support to the student. It is no longer based on where the student lived the most. If this parent has remarried as of the day of the FAFSA is filed, the step-parent's income, assets, and dependents must be reported on the FAFSA as well. Third question, how does this affect students who have uh, who have a social security but parents don't? So parents without social security number will now be able to create an FSA ID account. This new feature will launch on December 31st. Parents will be able to verify their account through TransUnion. And if parents are not able to verify their identity through the TransUnion process, there will be a manual process for them. Um, process for parents without social security to create FSA IDs. I think we went over that one. Um, so how are colleges going to offer financial aid with the delay in FAFSA processing? So by the end of January, institutions will receive ICERs. Once processing is com it's complete, students will receive financial aid award in one or three days. So um, award letters might be delayed as well due to this because um, colleges will not receive ICERs until the end of January. And I think those were all the questions that were sent to us. So why is work study being admitted? When will the process take place? Um, so uh, I don't know the answer to why it's been admitted, but um, colleges are going to determine um, how they're going to work their financial aid differently. So every college will, um, have that option and we'll work it out with their students differently. And then can you give us the link for the demo FAFSA? I will put the link to the demo FAFSA on the chat. Martha? Yes. I can help with that federal work study question. This is Janelle Cook from Colorado Mountain College. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Let me to go off camera here. Thanks for letting me join. Um, yeah, so the reason is within the FAFSA simplification, we're only um, re at, required to ask certain questions. And that is one question that we are not um, required to ask and we don't have the ability to ask the federal work study because um, they don't want us to ask unnecessary questions. So because schools already have the federal work study earnings amount, 
we are going to be reporting that information on behalf of the student to the Department of Ed. And then when they submit the FAFSA, when the student submits, it's going to be imported into the FAFSA application and still be used within the student aid index calculation. But again, not requiring students to answer the question because they're really trying to eliminate unnecessary questions. Thanks, Martha. Awesome. Thank you, Janelle. I appreciate it. Okay, so another question is once families complete the FAFSA, will they get any um, numbers before they would get the EFC and then SAR later? If I understood your presentation correctly, does this mean nothing will be given until the end of January? So, no, so they will receive their SAR and their Pell grant eligibility with an email once they finish their uh, FAFSA, but they will not receive their submission summary until the end of January. Um, and then why need for consent? I worry many mistakes will be made with this either by missing the info, then for family selecting that they do not consent because they believe they will not qualify. Um, so the reason why it is need that it, they need a consent is for the Department of Education to receive tax information. Um, so that is why it, it it's needed to give them the okay for them to transfer the information. Thanks, Martha. I have a question, um, which is, is the deadline for the FAFSA and the CASFA by the end of January? The answer is no, luckily. Um, deadline is an interesting word because, in fact, um, colleges and um, universities can award financial aid during the semester until the end of the semester um, that they're in. And I believe uh, summer term doesn't necessarily count. Um, so um, specifically fall and spring. So for a student who's going to be at MSU Denver um, in fall 2024, they could potentially submit their 24-25 FAFSA in November um, 2024 and receive aid. However, it is not as likely and we do not recommend that a student wait that long. Um, so long answer to the question, no, the deadline isn't by the end of December. We do recommend students complete, especially um, high school students, they should complete their FAFSA and CASFA before the end of the academic year, their 12th grade year of high school, so that they have access to that support. Um, if they don't, then they can always go to their financial aid offices at their colleges and universities to um, solicit support over the summer and potentially in the fall semester. Um, I, I don't know what high schools will be doing. Some high schools will want students to complete their FAFSA before they've graduated. Um, so to answer the question, the deadline is not the end of January. Um, please work with your students and families to recognize the earlier you submit a financial aid application, the sooner the financial aid office at your college and university can review it and award you aid, the sooner you can accept your aid, the better off you are. So um, long answer, um, but continue to support students in completing it um, quickly. That is the end of the questions in the form. Um, does anybody else have any additional questions? Um, please feel free to unmute and just ask. No? All right. I have a question and this is life from a student that does not wanna come into the screen, which is okay. Um, and this is Kasva from last year. Oh, this year, like he's just finishing high school early and he's going to college next semester. 23, um, 24, absolutely. Correct. Yeah. So he, he's EFC's uh, 5286. So we're assuming he's 5,286. Is that correct? Yes. And can he, what was the question? Is that, is that a good number to receive funds? 
Um, that is definitely a question for the financial aid office. If he's going to one of the more expensive um, universities, going, okay. for example, to, um, Metro. Great. Um, it will depend on um, how how much his cost of attendance is. So he will look at cost of attendance. He can check in with the financial aid office at Metro to see um, how much they'll be able to award. If he is asset eligible, he could potentially receive the Colorado student grant. But again, the Colorado student grant is need-based. So it'll be his cost of attendance um, and his EFC will um, basically determine um what Metro can award him. Again, I I do recommend since he's completed his CASPA, if he has any questions about the CASPA itself, I'm happy to help, but sounds like it's under control, which means he does need to check with Metro. Okay, perfect. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Martha, I'm sending you a couple other um, questions. We cannot hear you, Martha. I'm sorry. Oh, this is helpful. Okay, so um, one of the questions is, so the first student starts an account then invites contributor can do it all in one setting on the form. So no, how it's going to work is that the student will fill out their portion and then invite the contributors to do their part. So the student is not going to be able to fill out the parent's portion on their form. The parent has to do their part separately. And then Martha, can you please repeat what the formula is again for the term in SAI? So it's cost of attendance minus SAI minus other financial aid, it equals a need. Does, a, does the student have to, in, another question is, does the student have to initiate first or can parent, parent can initiate first as well. First, but first it's better to determine who is going to be the contributor. Do we want to talk about um, events that are coming up, Twyla? Sure. All right. So I think that is all. Oh, one more question. Can we uh, clarify what contributor means? Yeah, of course. So it's a new term. So it's anyone who is required to provide information on a student's form, such as a parent, step parent, or spouse. Great. All right. And we will make sure to put all these um, questions and answers up on the on our website. So I think um, we will make sure to do that. We will also put the all of the the whole slide deck and all that fun stuff. And we have some upcoming events um, here at the department. I will put the link in the chat. Oh, I think so. Uh, did she, somebody just put it there and let me see. Okay, so we have some upcoming events um, and I will put this in the chat. Sorry, I was doing too many things. All right, there it is. So we have some uh, presentations, FAFSA and CASFA um, Parent Night. We have one coming up in, um, on December 8th, uh, what's going on with CASPA, with Juntos. And then we also have a financial aid parent night at Fort Lupton High School on January 10th, and then a few conferences. So please check out our website. If you're interested in attending any of those, please reach out and we can um, get you connected. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I believe there... Uh... Can, can I ask one quick question? Yeah. Yes. Um, so if sometimes we will have like parent nights or meetings, especially for Spanish speaking folks, could we have the parents start the FAFSA and then the student finishes? It sounded like in the last question that maybe the parent, the contributor could start it 
And then would the student get invited? How would that work? Yes. So when they log in um, in the prototype, as soon as they log in, it will let them know, are you the student or are you the parent? So they can right. click parent and fill out that information. Okay. And then would the student get an email saying you need to finish this part or how does that work? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you all so much. We hope uh, you can join us uh, at our next um, Better FAFSA and CASFA Lunch and Learn on December 13th. Um, and thank you all very much. Have a great day. Thank you, Twyla. Thank you, Martha.